Okay, the intermediate value theorem is not a huge deal that you need to really stress over. But it is something we're thinking about here, and it's related to continuity. Okay, the intermediate value theorem is just an idea that if you have a function and you know something about it being continuous, if you know it's continuous from A to B, if you know a function is continuous from A to B and you know this is its value here, say 1, and its value at B is 7, if you know it's continuous, I'm going to put if continuous, I'm going to write this into kind of everyday language that I would. If you look in the textbook, it's very mathematical how they've written it out, which is, which is fine. If you, if you know it's continuous, however it goes here, it has to take on every value from 1 up to 7. Okay? A real world example of this is if you're in a hot air balloon or something and you're 100 meters off the ground, feet let's say, maybe meters, I don't know how you go in a hot air balloon. If you're 100 feet off the ground and then later on, so at like one minute after start or something like that and then 10 minutes later, it's probably too fast to, to, to ascend, but you're 400 feet off the ground and you know that the balloon travels continuously, you must have traveled, you must have at some point you've been at every one of these altitudes, right? Does that make sense? I mean, that's intuitively obvious, right? You don't suddenly te teleport from, you know, 150 meters up to here, right? If this is a graph of, well, I got one and seven here, different numbers, but if this is kind of like the hot air balloon, it has to hit every one of these altitudes in here if you know it's continuous. Now the hot air balloon has to be continuous. It doesn't travel suddenly, jump up. That's all the intermediate value theorem says. If you know it's continuous, then it must hit every value, okay? So I'm gonna say here, if this thing is continuous on the interval from, uh oh, tablet. It's continuous on the interval from A to B, then, if we call this f of x, we need a name for it. Okay, if f of x is continuous on that interval, then f of x takes on, takes on every value between, now I'm not going to use the specific numbers here, I want to talk in general. Instead of 1 and 7, I'm just going to call this f of a and f of b, whatever those values are, right? It has to hit every value in between f of a and f of b. If you know it's at f of a at the start and it's at f of b at the end and you know it's continuous, it has to hit every value between f of a and f of b. All right? That's the intermediate value theorem. Now, as much as this graph is beautiful and I'm very proud of it, I'm going to show you this one because this might be a little more dynamic and might work a little better for you. So this is just a function here. Now, this function right now, obviously, from, let's say, from negative 3 to, to 1, it's obviously not continuous because there's that break there, right? There's a point of discontinuity at negative 1. So if I go, if I start at this side, it's continuously, like you watch the red line on the y-axis here, it's from now it's taking on every y value from negative 2 up to 0 but then suddenly it's going to skip a bunch of them right suddenly it skips up to there which ones did it miss like in your mind you look it looks like it's jumping up there but it it skips all the values in between 0 and whatever this y value is here since it's not continuous it it can skip some of the y values and then it might come back down again and go up here but you don't know for sure that it's taken on every value in between negative 2 and whatever this value is up here, 3 or something like that. It hasn't taken on every value. Oops, let's enlarge it a little bit. If you make this continuous though, okay, we can join that together. Now that it's continuous, you know it has to take on every value, right? Now it's gonna, it, that line is going to hit every y value all the way up here at some point. It might go back down again, might go up. 
but it covers, you know for sure it covers. The only way to know for sure that all the y values are covered are to know it's a continuous function. It might, it might not be a continuous function and still cover all the y values. So it's only a kind of a one-way one -way relationship, right? This one still covers all the y values even though there's a break. But the only way to guarantee that it covers all the y values is to know that this is continuous. That's the intermediate value theorem. All right? Do we think we understand that? Yes, no, maybe. Now, it's hard to ask a question where you use that because it isn't like this is one of these math things where you're not learning a procedure or something like that. It isn't here's how to solve an equation. Now go solve a thousand equations. The higher up you go in math, more often the things you learn are like this where they're conceptual versus procedural. Right? You can learn something in grade 8. Here's how to solve a one-step equation. Now here's a thousand one-step equations to solve. This is a concept, a conceptual thing that if you know this is true, then that's true. It's hard to kind of give you problems that, in, that involve that. This is one where you could use that to answer the question. I know with technology you can kind of answer it pretty quickly without having to know the intermediate value theorem. But let's just quickly look at this and see how you could apply the intermediate value theorem. Is any real number less exactly one less than its cube? Okay, mathematicians have to use the word exactly to be precise on things. Is any real number exactly one less than its cube? So you could say if the number that we're looking for is x, or if you really want to sound like a mathematician, you'd say let x equal such a number or whatever, something, right? If you're using x to be the number, right? Then what you want to know is that number, if I take it away from its cube, so if I subtract it from that number cubed, what do we want that to be? We want it to be 1, all right? Now, this is a cubic. If this was a, if this was a 2 here, you'd probably resort to some grade... 10 and 11 stuff where you'd solve quadratics and you'd find it, right? The problem is if this is a cubic, is there a, there's a quadratic formula. Is there a cubic formula? There's not, right? And you could try factoring if, if this was a zero, this would be really easy to solve because you could just factor out this and you and go from there. But the fact that this is a one, you know, you could try doing some algebra and factoring, but you're going to find that it's not going to work. But with the intermediate value theorem, you can if the if the question is just is there a number and you don't you don't actually care what it is, you just want to know is there, it's pretty easy to argue that there has to be if you think about a graph here. So this is uh, let's maybe do a better job of making this graph here. Um, so there's some axes. If we know if we find two points in there and then we know this is continuous. This function, polynomials are always continuous. They're continuous for all real numbers. So you have to know that fact. Polynomials are continuous for all real numbers. So as long as you know that fact and you find a couple values on a graph here, if we look at a function that we call f equals, or not f, yeah, I was writing something different than I'm saying here. If we use a function that's f of x is x cubed minus x, so if you graph this and then look at what the graph looks like, and not even graph it, we're just going to say we can look at two points here and answer the question. Okay, let's shrink down this so I give myself some more room, which is not going to work, so we'll just move it over there. There we go. If we know two things here, let's say, what's f of 0 if this is our function we're going to look at here? What value do you get? It, like, is the number 0? The number is obviously not 0, right? You could just start doing by trial and error. What's 0 cubed minus 0 is obviously 0. So this is not it, right? The number is not 0, but if you put in, if you put in uh, 0, you get 0. What about if you put in 1? 1 cubed minus 1. You also get 0. There's another point on the graph, right? What about if you put 2? Two? 
2 cubed minus 2, what does that give you? 6, right? So, you know, here's 1, here's 2. 2 is going to give you 6 up here, right? So we got, we have those points on the graph. We know, we know those three points, and you only need two of them to make the argument here. These are the only two you need. Well, actually, it doesn't matter which one. You need this one and one of the other two. Let's say we use this one. If you know that it's continuous everywhere, and you know at this point it's at 1, and at this point it's at, or sorry, at 0, and this point it's at 6, like it's at this level, and then it's at this level, and we want to know, is it ever at this level? Is it ever 1? Doesn't it have to be at 1 at some point? However you draw this graph, whether it looks like this, and uh, or it looks like, I guess it can't look like that because it's a cubic. It probably looks something like this. But however it looks, doesn't it have to hit 1 at some point? It has to, right? So that's that's just a you know a situation where you could use the intermediate value theorem to argue that it's that it does exist. Of course, if you really wanted to solve it, you put that on your graphing calculator, and then you find the intersection with one. You graph y another you know another function equal to one, and then find the intersection point. But I want you to see in a in a context here the intermediate value theorem. All right, it's not a huge deal. We don't use it all that often, but it's something that you need to have a look at. Okay, hopefully that's okay.